if you look at the Holy Land map, this is an ancient one from 900 years ago. Um, this area is considered the Holy Land area. You have the Sea of Galilee and the Dead Sea. The reason I bring you to these familiar landmarks, when you talk about Armageddon, you're talking about an area that's mentioned only once in the Bible. In Revelation chapter 16 is the chapter that deals with the seven last plagues. In Revelation 16, 16, it says they gathered them together to the place called in Hebrew Armageddon. And on the map, you see the arrow. There's a valley. I'm going to take you to the Estrelon Valley tonight so you can actually see what's represented there in the Estrelon Valley. But I want you to notice on the map, right above the red arrow along the coastline, there's a little bump that goes out like a peninsula out into the Mediterranean Sea there. That is Mount Carmel where Elijah had the showdown with the false prophets of Baal. It's talked about in 1 Kings chapter 17 and 18. Also, you've got um, the valley, uh, Estrelon Valley, that runs from the circle all the way down to the other area, which is the area known as the Valley of Jezreel. That's mentioned in the story of Gideon. So it's all part of that Estrelon Valley um, and what's known as Armageddon. It's actually too small for a modern day army to have a great battle, but we'll study what Armageddon means in the biblical terms as well as in modern terminology. This is a view of that valley today. If you have not seen the Estrelon Valley, this is what it looks like. It looks like farmland. The popular meaning of the word Armageddon is the last great battle. That's the most popular meaning, but because the word Armageddon is only found once in Scripture, it's not a, they're not exactly sure what it means. The term Armageddon is made up of two words, they believe. Ar, which is pronounced in the Hebrew tongue, Har, and Megiddon or Megiddo, which is an ancient city. The mountain plus Megiddo, which would be the end of the valley that I showed you where the red arrow was pointing. That's the most uh, accurate definition. In the Hebrew, it's pronounced Armageddon or Armageddon, we say today, because it's only used once in the Bible, there is another view, and it actually fits also into the biblical scenario, R meaning mountain, and then Moed, if it comes from the word Moed rather than Megiddon, which is the city, and I'm going to take you down to the ancient ruins, which was uh, Megiddo. But Moed means the congregation, and it's a mindset that people are into. Now, we see a certain mindset in the world today in the cancel, cancel culture, where people want to cancel out someone if that person disagrees with them, the cancel culture. This mindset would be all of the people, the congregation, Moed, into a certain mindset. And it, the word actually comes from Isaiah 14, 13, when it talks about Lucifer getting the world into the mindset, the mindset that he wants them to be in. When it talks about him ascending to power, you've said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit on the mount of the congregation on the farthest sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. Uh, sitting on the mount of the congregation is kind of controlling the way the congregation is thinking. He's rebellion, his rebellion against heaven is trying to control the minds of people, and that will actually take place in the end of time.
So that definition, although it's not as popular as the first one with biblical scholars, it also has some biblical significance. It says they gathered them together to the place in the Hebrew tongue called Armageddon, Revelation 16, 16. The slide you're seeing is the archeological remains of the 20th level of diggings of the city of Megiddo. They dug down there and they found Solomon's war city of Megiddo on the base of Mount uh, Carmel. And this is the view here in 1 Kings 9, 15. It says, this is the reason for the labor force which King Solomon raised to build the house of the Lord, his own house, the Milo, the wall of Jerusalem, Hazor, Megiddo is mentioned there as one of his war cities. Solomon had 40,000 stalls of horses for his chariots and 12,000 horsemen stationed there at his war city of Megiddo, according to 1 Kings 4.26. I have been there to those ancient ruins. This is what it looks like with the ancient diggings and the um, horse troughs uncovered there where they used to feed the horses. Solomon gathered chariots and horsemen. He had 1,400 chariots and 12,000 horsemen whom he stationed in the chariot cities with the king in Jerusalem. Here's the chart about Armageddon. Um, and the reason I made this chart up is that it has many different um, stories that tell us about Armageddon and many, all of these different stories and themes that run through the book of Revelation um, tell us a little bit more about that last great battle. The mark of the beast versus the seal of God. The book of Revelation is a book of contrast. The valley of Jehoshaphat or the valley of judgment is Joel chapter 2 and 3, where it talks about people being multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision, according to um, Joel 3 verse 14. The Valley of Estralon is where many battles were fought in the Old Testament, where God fought for his people in the Valley of Estralon, and he sent hornets in front of his army so that it would attack the enemy, and they would be overcome by hornets. And God also uh, rained hailstones down, and the Old Testament says that more people died from the hailstones than they did from the soldiers' swords. So that's the Valley of Estralon. All of these tell us about Armageddon. Elijah and Mount Carmel is right there where I showed you on the map. It's a little peninsula. We were down at the base of the mountain at Megiddo. That's part of the name, Armageddon. Um, that's the story of Elijah and the Mount Carmel prophets in 1 Kings 17 and 18. Esther and the death decree, of course, that's found in the book of Esther, Daniel, and the image of the beast, all of that deals with the end of time. Six times in the book of Revelation, the image of the beast is mentioned, and that's why it's part of telling us what the last great battle will be all about. It's a battle of loyalty between God and his people. They want to be loyal to him and stand up for him. Uh, we can study all of these different studies if we want to understand Armageddon and the true meaning of the word Armageddon. And then, of course, you've got Gideon in the Valley of Jezreel, and that was on our map, um, Judges 6 and 7, where Gideon overcame without a sword. He stepped forward in faith with 300 against 120,000 uh, warriors. And then Jacob's time of trouble, of course, and that fits in with um, the end of time and the Battle of Armageddon also. And that gives you kind of an overview. Let's look at the stories for a moment. Here's Gideon in the faithful few in Judges 6 and 7, where God's people were in the minority against insurmountable odds, yet victorious. God fought for his people in that story. One of the things you're going to see is that in all of the stories, and all the stories are different, 
And yet all of them tell us the same thing. The theme is the same. God is fighting for his people in that last great battle. That's what the battle is about. Not that God's people are doing any fighting, but God is fighting for his people. Gideon fought with 300 soldiers. He didn't actually have a sword. He had the light of truth and he had a trumpet. And they stood on the edge of the camp of the opposing warriors, the Midianites, and the Midianites destroyed themselves. God caused them to be in confusion. The Bible says Gideon and the hundred men that were with him came to the outpost of the camp at the beginning of the watch, just as they posted the watch. They blew the trumpets and broke the pitchers that were in their hands. Notice he didn't have any sword in his hand. Then the 300 companies blew the trumpets and broke the pitchers. They held the torches in their left hands, the trumpets in their right hand for blowing. And they cried, the sword of the Lord and of Gideon. And every man stood in his place all around the camp. And the whole army ran and cried out and fled. 120,000 soldiers died in the Midianite army. And Israel was victorious with the 300 fascinating story, wonderful story, Judges 7, uh, verse 20 and 21 here, but the whole story, you need to read it, become familiar with it, uh, mark it in your Bible, it goes along with the story and the battles of Armageddon, but it tells us a lot about Armageddon, the story of Gideon in Judges 6 and 7. 120,000 men who drew the sword had fallen, that was the Midianites that were destroyed. Moving along to Elijah and Mount Carmel in 1 Kings chapter 17, verse 18. There was a famine for three and a half years. God provided for Elijah during that time. So God will provide for his people during the time of trouble. Uh, Isaiah gives us some promises that says that. Isaiah 31, Isaiah 41. There are several different places in Isaiah that say your bread and water will be sure. Your refuge will be the munitions of rocks. God will open strings, streams of water in the desert. So God provided for Elijah during that time. You remember he fed him with the widow of Zarephath and the oil did not run out. Wicked King Ahab blamed Elijah for the famine. Wonderful story, but it fits right in with Armageddon in Revelation because Revelation mentions that God's people will be keeping the commandments of God. Three times it mentions that in Revelation, but in 1 Kings chapter 18, when Ahab approaches Elijah, he says, oh, there you are, troubler of Israel. And Elijah's answer to wicked King Ahab is a classic. And he says, I am not the trouble of Israel, but you have troubled Israel, you and your father's house because you have forsaken the commandments of God. This is in the Old Testament, talking about people forsaking God's commandments. And then, of course, there's the showdown on Mount Carmel between Elijah and the prophets of Baal. And the prophets of Baal are slain, and God's people are victorious. All of these stories tell us about what happens at Armageddon. Revelation 16, 14, it says... And this is the chapter, Revelation 16, that talks about the time of trouble and the last great battle, where they are the spirits of demons performing signs which go out to the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to the battle of the great day of God Almighty. Now that's Revelation 16, 14, showing you that the whole world will be involved in that last great battle. Revelation 19, 19 is a picture of Jesus coming with the armies of heaven to fight for his people. It's a picture of the second coming, where he's coming to deliver his, be his people from the beast who has passed a death decree against them. I saw the beast, the kings of the earth, their armies gathered together to make war against him who sat on the horse and against his army. Well, God's armies come and they are victorious over the beast. They, God is coming to fight for his people. Again, it says the beast was captured with him, the false prophet who worked signs in the presence by which he deceived those who received the mark of the beast, those that worshiped his image. These two were cast alive into the lake of fire burning with brimstone. And then Revelation 16, verse 2, of course, 
which talks about the first went, poured out his bowl upon the earth, a foul and loathsome sore came upon the men who had the mark of the beast and those who worshiped his image. This is the last great battle where God is fighting for his people. And then in Revelation 16, 10, of course, under the fifth plague, the fifth angel poured out his bowl on the throne of the beast. His kingdom became full of darkness. They gnawed their tongue because of the pain. Now, if you read Revelation 16, verse 8 and 9, and then 10 and 11, it says that people don't repent during this time of trouble. That's the exact opposite of what is taught in the rapture theory, where the rapture theory teaches that the Jews will be converted and they will begin to convert people during the time of trouble. Well, that's not what it says in Revelation 16 when it talks about the time of trouble. It's telling us about the battle of Armageddon. Revelation 16, 14, again, talking about the demons that go forth to perform signs and gather the world together to this last great battle. He cried mightily with a loud voice, saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, has become the habitation of demons, a prison for every foul spirit, a cage for every unclean and hated bird. Of course, that's Revelation 18, verse 2. And then 16, 5 and 6, it says, You are righteous, O Lord, the one who is, who was, who is to be, because you have judged these things. For they have shed the blood of the saints and the prophets, and you have given them blood to drink, for it is their just due. God is fighting for his people. Part of the seven last plagues is God giving them what they deserve, fighting for his people. That theme runs all through all of these stories where God is fighting in the last great battle for his people. And then notice in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 6 and 9, and this isn't prophecy in the sense of we normally think of prophecy in Daniel and Revelation, but notice what it says. It's almost the same words that we saw in Revelation chapter 16. I want to go back just for a moment. Notice it says here, when it's talking about the seven last plagues, and we're talking about Armageddon here, it says, you are righteous, O Lord. For they've done this, and you are giving them their just due. You're giving them blood to drink. Now, that's in the seven last plagues. But notice in 2 Thessalonians, since it is a righteous thing with God to repay. Repay means to give back, to repay with tribulation those who trouble you. Well, in the end of time, the Bible talks about those that worship the beast get the mark of the beast, and they... The ones that are following God can't buy or sell, and God has to provide for them. Notice the language here in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, and you want to mark this in your Bible and connect it up with Revelation 16. It says, it is a righteous thing with God to repay with tribulation those who trouble you, and to give you who are troubled rest with us when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on those who do not know God, on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. These shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. So God, again, is portrayed as fighting for his people, and he's going to be the one that stands up for them in this last great battle. And then Revelation, of course, 17, when it says these will make war with the Lamb and the Lamb will overcome them. He is the Lord of Lords, King of Kings. Those who are with him are called chosen and faithful. Revelation 19 verses 11 to 21 talk about the second coming and God fighting for his people. That's the second coming portrayed in the book of Revelation. Jesus is riding with a white horse. He's called the Word of God. That means he's going to be standing up for what his word says. God's people are standing up and loyal to him, and they're following what the word says. Of course, Revelation chapter 12, verse 17, is the first of the references to God's people that keep the Ten Commandments. The dragon was angry or wroth with the woman that went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. 
Here is the patience of the saints. Here's the second time it mentions. It mentions three different times in the book of Revelation that God's people are keeping the commandments. They're being faithful to God. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and they have the faith of Jesus. Revelation 15, 2. I saw something like a sea of glass mingled with fire. Those that have the victory over the beast, victory over the image, over his mark, over the number of his name, standing on the sea of glass, having the harps of God. They're victorious. They're standing there and Jesus is coming to accept them and to redeem them. And then, of course, Revelation 18, rejoice over her, O heaven, and you holy apostles and prophets, for God has avenged her on uh, you on her. And then Revelation 13, it talks about Satan's tactics in that last great battle. He will be trying to deceive people. It says he performs great signs so that he even makes fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. He deceives those that dwell on the earth by the signs which was granted to do in the sight of the beast, telling those who dwell on the earth to make an image to the beast who was wounded by the sword and yet lived. Satan's strategy at the end of time is to be deceptive and to deceive God's people. And that's what we're heading for now. And we see that. It says they are the spirits of de demons performing signs which go out to the kings of the earth and the whole world to gather them to that battle of the great day of God Almighty. And then, of course, the Bible says in 2 Corinthians 11, these are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into apostles of Christ. And no wonder, for Satan himself transforms himself into an angel of light. It is no great thing if his ministers also transform themselves into ministers of righteousness, whose end will be according to their works. We have to look at people and what they're doing, not just what they're saying at the end of time, because Satan will infiltrate the church. And then, of course, Revelation 16, it says the great city was divided in three parts. The cities of the nations fell. Great Babylon came in remembrance before God to give unto her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath. Every island fled away and the mountains were not found. And then it talks about this great hailstone out of heaven. Every one about the weight of a talent. That's a 90-pound ball of ice. Men blaspheme God because of the plague of the hail. The plague thereof was exceedingly great. That's a ball of ice that's about 21 inches in diameter. Now, I used to work on an ice truck for a camp meeting. A 90-pound ball of ice is maybe 19 to 23 inches, depending on the hardness of the ice. But this is uh, in relation to size, what it would look like. I dropped a five pound block of ice when I was working on the ice truck during camp meeting and I dropped it from uh, two feet above my foot and I about broke my foot when I dropped that five pound block of ice on it. Think if God hurls a 90 pound ball of ice about 23 inches in diameter from heaven, their only safety that you're going to find is in Jesus. Job 38 says, Have you entered the treasury of the snow or seen the treasury of the hail, which I have reserved for the time of trouble, for the day of battle and war? Revelation 19, I mentioned about his name being called the Word of God. He was clothed with, with a robe dipped in blood. That's talking about Jesus riding on the white horse in Revelation 19, the second coming. And his name is called the Word of God. The Bible says, of course, in 1 John 1, that the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. Verse 14, you may want to reference that to this reference in Revelation 19. Mark your Bibles and put that down so that you have the word of God talked about in the end of time. Also, with this battle of Armageddon and God's word and how important it will be that you stick with God's word. In Revelation 19, again, it says, out of his mouth goes a sharp sword. that With it, he should strike the nations. He himself will rule them with a rod of iron. He treads the winepress of the fierceness and the wrath of Almighty God. Now. As a highlight, I don't have 
a picture here. I do have a picture and I could show it to you. But when I went to see the burial place of Jesus in Jerusalem, they say that the Church of the Holy Sepulchre is the real place of Jesus' burial, and that was originally outside of the walls of the city. Well, that didn't really, when I went in that tomb, that didn't look to me a lot like the, what I pictured in my mind as the burial place in the garden tomb, so to speak. But outside the city, um, I went down to the garden tomb and took pictures there, and that looked more like what I pictured in my mind. Now, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, because they build churches over holy sites, maybe that's the original spot. But I noticed something interesting about the garden tomb, which is a little ways away, farther away from the city, when I went there and took pictures of the garden tomb. It's a family tomb, and it should be, because uh, Jesus was laying in that tomb, which no one had ever been buried in. But when I turned around from the garden tomb and started to walk away, I found a wine press. A wine press that's about 30 feet away from the garden tomb. And it's interesting that, that, that here it says, he treads the wine press of the fierceness of the wrath of Almighty God, and there's a wine press right by the garden tomb. To me, that was really important and significant and beautiful to find all of that there. The Bible says in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 17, take the helmet of salvation, the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. That's to be our part of our armor. We hide in the Word of God. The Word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit, of the joints and marrow, is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. So we have to stand close to God's Word have that built into our minds, mark our Bibles like we've been talking about so we're prepared for this last great battle because it mentions it over and over and over. The angel of the church of Pergamos write, these things saith he who has the sharp two-edged sword. And then, of course, it talks about how God's people overcome in the end of time. It says they overcame, and it talks about Satan being thrown out of heaven and being thrown down to the earth. And it says they overcome him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. And they love not their lives unto the death. God's people have to be willing to stand up for him and give up their life. Not that they're going to be slain at the end of time, but they're willing to do that. They would rather die than be disloyal to God. They overcame him by the word of uh the blood of the lamb and the word of their testimony each one of us needs to have our own testimony of what jesus means to us and what he's done for us in matthew chapter 24 it talks about the signs of the second coming and one of the first things that jesus says when the disciples says tell us about your coming and what will happen at the end of time the first thing Jesus says isn't about earthquakes or famines or wars or this dark day or the stars falling, but he says, take heed that no one deceives you. There's going to be a lot of deceptions at the end of time about the second coming, about the battle of Armageddon, and we need to be prepared for that. He said, false Christ and false prophets will rise and show great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the very elect. In Luke 24, it says, So it was while they conversed and reasoned that Jesus himself drew near and went with them, but their eyes were restrained so that they did not know him. Of course, this is the on the road to um, where they were going and walking with Jesus in Luke 24, when Jesus is walking beside them. And notice the emphasis that their eyes were restrained or blocked like they had blinders on so they really couldn't recognize Jesus and there was a reason for that so that they would base what they believe on what his word says the same thing is true today when we study with people we have to be convinced by the word of God not by um, 
you know, uh, an experience that we may have in our life or something like that, something that's a little more um, objective, we want to be, or subjective, I should say, we want to be very objective and go by God's word. That's why Jesus kind of uh, blinded their eyes. Otherwise, they would have just said, oh, it's Jesus, we'll believe whatever you say. He wants us to believe his word. Then their eyes were opened and they knew him. He vanished out of their sight. They said to one another, did not our heart burn within us while he talked with us on the road and while he opened the scriptures to us? Jesus wants us to open the scriptures and to study. Of course, Jesus said, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but who does the will of my father in heaven? Many will say in that day, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name? cast out demons in your name, done many wonders in your name, then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. We have a lot of lawlessness being practiced today in the world. Jesus said, hypocrites, well did Isaiah prophesy about you. These people draw near to me with their mouth, honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. In vain they worship me, teaching as doctrines, the commandments of men. We want to be teaching um, the commandments of God, not the commandments of men. Blessed is he who reads those that hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written in it, for the time is near. Okay, so we get a special blessing by hearing the prophecies of Revelation, and we've talked about them tonight about Armageddon, kind of giving an overview of what Armageddon, we would have to study each one of these stories individually. The story in Daniel 3 of the false image of the beast, and we could study that. And then the story of the showdown in 1 Kings 17 and 18 with the false prophets of Baal, with Elijah on Mount Carmel. All of these different stories tell us something about that time where God says, he will be fighting for his people. He says, behold, I come quickly. Blessed is he who keeps the words of the book, uh, the words of the prophecy of this book. God wants us to follow through and keep these things in our hearts and to be blessed by it. Okay. All right. Well, let's have prayer and then we'll take questions after we end on this study on Armageddon. So let's bow our heads together. Father, we thank you for the clarity of your word about Armageddon, when you will be fighting for your people, and we as your people need to be standing up for you and being loyal to you. Uh, we thank you for the promise of you being by our side through calamity and tragedies. And we ask for your blessing on our study tonight, in Jesus' name, amen.